Hi, Gautam and Dol. Lovely to connect. It's um, such a pleasure to have you on the series, and I'm delighted uh, to be introducing you to everyone. Um, Gautam and Dol are both filmmakers and work on wildlife and environment films. They have a really interesting story to tell, and I'm going to leave them to tell you their story in their words. <laughs> Over to you. Well, thanks for having us. Really excited for this. And uh, and what fun to uh, to be. I mean, minus the pandemic behind all of this, but what fun to be connecting with uh, so many people through uh, you know webinars and uh, virtual chats and just a different way of telling stories as well. And that's been our work mostly. I think is just trying to tell stories and trying to make people care, trying to uh, get attention sometimes to uh, you know just environmental issues, things like that, like the uh, the Bang Valley. All the, the terrible projects going on. So uh, I think we're we're filmmakers by profession, but I think we're in the whole storytelling uh, business. Maybe <laughs> not too much of a business, though. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> what do you think? I find it very hard to talk about myself and my work. So I always uh, hide behind the larger idea of what River Banks does and how it started. Uh, and uh, River Banks, as you know, our company was started by uh, Mike, Mike Pandey, and the way um, you know, just telling it straight and not hiding behind, you know, uh, and not going around the story. And so I think that has been the core uh, responsibility we feel at River Banks is that find a story, tell it. Uh, in a good way and now we are finding now that there is so much content out there and everyone's watching online uh it's it now we feel challenged and excited actually to tell stories in a more entertaining way maybe. so i think that's the goal going forward is to find uh newer audiences to watch the conservation stories yeah. that we have to tell documentaries have this uh you know, this hapa of being pedantic and boring and just too information heavy. And and I admit, I mean, I, I don't watch too many documentaries either. Uh, only ones which, uh, you know, if I don't feel like switching it off in the first five minutes. So, and, and I think uh, a lot of uh, documentary filmmakers have woken up to that. And we can see, uh, you know, on platforms like Netflix, uh, there are different ways of uh, engaging people and telling stories and audiences and I, I think we should be learning from them even from the, from the way fiction stories are being told so uh, yeah hope to show you give you a little glimpse into what we've been up to and a uh, couple of films we, we finished recently was uh, 360 in VR and uh, we, we tried uh, making a snow leopard film and we just give you a glimpse into that as well Sounds amazing. I can't. <laughs> so let's see the presentation. Okay, so uh, Shan is a snow leopard in Ladakhi, as you know already. And I think one of the things, uh, these thoughts that uh, both of us had while going in, thank you, uh, snow leopard films, was to move away from the ghost of the mountains. <laughs> Because there's a whole, uh, I, I never really liked that term too much. So we kept thinking of different ways of trying to talk about snow leopards and not just leaning to the ghost of the mountains. So, so I'm still trying. So the one we filmed, uh, we gave her a name, Yamo, and we called her the Queen of the Mountains. And uh, I, I thought the secretive one also works pretty well for snow leopards. <laughs> so, and I, I would say it's definitely in the top three most secretive animals that we've tried to make a film on. Another one is the Western Tragopan. That might be harder than the Snow Leopard actually. I think that was harder. Yeah, we, <laughs> we spent two years trying to film it and we got like one shaky shot and one really grainy <laughs> camera trap image and we, we lost part, part of ourselves in that forest somewhere. This is in the GHNP. So, this, this was the view uh, that everyone sees when they take that flight into the dark and I remember thinking that there must be a snow leopard down there somewhere and you obviously can't see it but, and then you see how large this landscape is 
and there is this real feeling of it we never going to find it and uh, you, you really have to believe in in luck and uh, you know you, you look at each stupa as you drive past wishing you some good karma rubs off as you as you go into this amazing amazing landscape so because snow leopards were uh, you know I, i think the year we started snow leopards had become common like that like everyone seemed to be working on a comp on a snow leopard film so we decided to work on uh, the himalayan lynx and we did a lot of research went looking for locations uh, a friend of ours stands in uh, you know we, we had only one camera tap at that point so i gave him that camera tap uh, and his uh, sister you know the shepherdess and she had told him that oh i've seen a lynx e in ladakh i love that name and uh, so he he said that well if you give it to me i'll try uh, you know she says that it lives in this uh, on this mountain i said wow that might even be a den over there so gave him this camera trap and after months he sent back this footage and uh, this is what we got from that footage actually These are all all false triggers with the camera trap. They just trigger, so it was just snow melting. The color of black, the black mask. Horrible sheets. And we got our first snow leopard shot. And we were disappointed because it wasn't a lynx. <laughs> But. Uh, but we got a snow leopard shot. I think, oh my god! So maybe, maybe it is worth giving it a shot. Maybe it's a sign that we should be thinking of snow leopards. And the lynx uh, is so secretive that we still haven't got a shot of, of the lynx or the other one of the lynx. So uh, armed with this, uh, you know, great confidence, we went and we bought a few more camera traps, and then we uh, uh, started exploring places to go to, which led us to Ule. a uh, place which you know very well as well and david t who had been calling us for years he will say uh you know to come and have a look and then uh, ule is just one of those uh, you know the first spot we looked in was just the the perfect location i mean all these stories also happened over many many i think over almost a year and a half to where uh, i mean it all sounds like it all happened in one go but There was a lot of like reading and interest and trying to get to know the habitat and I mean it wasn't just trying to get that shot. I mean we were also trying to understand this landscape and uh, David and Stan's in the whole part of seeing the place yeah. from their eyes, yeah. you know, because we didn't know it at all. So that was what was so nice and we became friends uh, in the process with them. And so there was a lot of information just going and coming and that's what a lot of people like don't realize with uh, making films like this so any making any film where you're trying to tell a story beyond just the shot you see is that there is so much time uh, has been spent that cannot be measured which has just been studying and understanding and researching and talking to people and uh, and filmmakers spend a lot of time before they uh, pick up the camera to take that first shot Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So then, armed with more camera traps, which was basically I think one more camera trap, but they were really expensive back then. <laughs> so, so when we now get two camera traps, so went back to Ule. We like we uh, we met Norbu and his family, and uh, no, before you went there, you were uh, spending weeks just uh, drilling the camera trap and trying to make like a safe box for it. And no, that's the later camera. That trap. was the later camera. Okay. So and and then we started uh, placing some camera traps around there, and then we, we were working with the wildlife department as well. And that's also, I think, really important to kind of keep everyone in the know, as well as you know, when we try and go and do work like this. One is that uh, you know, then people know, and they don't want to steal your camera trap too easily. It's always a risk, uh, you know, in places like India for sure. Uh, like that, much much less. We haven't had one stolen yet. One was picked up, but it got returned also. Uh, but I think it was just 
we we work like that and we enjoy working with a larger network of friends and people we love and uh, uh, who are thinking this in the same way that we are where like the whole is not just about the shot but there's a larger mission at play and then we need we you know this collective force and critical mass behind it to succeed in reach where it has to reach so second camera trap came with again false triggers as you see so these are all false triggers and then we got our second snow leopard shot which was much better than the first one <laughs> so even more uh, you know excited by this we started building a story in our heads of how we could uh, you know not just turn it into like a, a trophy hunt kind of a film of Uh, you know, we going out there to get this, and uh, uh, how do we layer it more? And then, as we spend, uh, you know, numerous weeks out there, going back, uh, you know, meeting people, looking at things besides the snow leopard, uh, which is a natural process. Uh, you know, when you're making a documentary film, just looking at all the angles, we started seeing uh, there was much more to the story than just you know one of the world's rarest cats. Uh, so went back in winter, uh, and then uh, I told Norbu that you know if there is a kill that happens, you just have to tell me. I'm going to figure it out, but I'll get there. So uh, this was in winter when I went up. He called and he's like, "Come fast! It's uh, it's an ibex. It's not too big. It'll finish in two days." So I'm there. I booked a ticket that fast. <laughs> I'm always trying to compare rates or whatever. It's like boom, 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 click, click, click. It's Book. a result of always working on a very tight budget in India. I mean, that's the yeah. rea- reality of it. Unlike you know all those beautiful images that come out of very like there is a sense of uh, relaxation with a good budget. You know, you are not thinking about budgets when you're trying to go film something. Unfortunately, we have to have the producer hat on, the artist hat on, the story hat on, <laughs> all of that in one yeah. go, and thinking how much does this ticket cost? Why are you thinking how I'm going to take this shot? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the producer hat spoke as I was booking the ticket. Are you sure? I mean, what if it's already over by the time you get there? I said, Yeah, but and then it's so called up. No, I said I need enough reason. I said, Has it snowed? He said, Yes, it snowed. I said, Oh my God, snow leopard in the snow. Like it's alone, right? It's like no, it has two cups. It's like what? <laughs> It's like okay, book the ticket now. Book the ticket, and then of course, acclimatization is a big thing. It is uh, you know it's easy to get overconfident after you do a few trips, but I think that's when it hits the worst. And I was just silly. Uh, I mean, it was also about getting this rare opportunity to film. A snow leopard with cubs on a kill on an ibex kill in the snow. So I took a calculated risk, and uh, I, I was you know no homeopathic medicines and stuff like that to try and take the edge off. We guys being stupid, the most foolish thing Gautam has done in his wildlife filmmaking career. <laughs> anyway, so we went, and then uh, the kill was there, and uh, the, the fever was right up on the ridge, just like a dot, and you can't really film those uh, things. And then I was set up. And as luck would have it, as she was coming down towards the evening, a group of tourists came, and news spread fast. And there was a lot of shore sharaba happening, and uh, so she basically got disturbed and she left. So this is where I became stupid. So I said, I'm going to spend the night in a hide over there, and I'll be the first one over here, and I'll film her just as dawn is breaking. So the hide was this tent, and uh, it was it was cold. But I didn't know how cold it would get, and uh, Morup's mother, as I was leaving, uh, she had this great look of concern in her on her face, and she said, "Ek raat bhi saw raat lagegi," and that just haunted me. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, "And साढ़े तीन बजे हवा चलती है यहाँ पे अलग तरीके हवा. There's a specific word she had for that hawa, and." Uh, It was true. At 3:30 a.m., this wind blew, and it would just nothing worked at that point because uh, it was super, super, super cold. But the ibex kill—I don't know if you can see my cursor. It's on the top of the 
the image right up there in the top so it's pretty far away from it uh but i had the most amazing night of my life uh, in that high because around 12 am uh, as i was waiting quietly uh, i heard the sound around the tent like and i thought it must be uh, you know a fox but it flipped and it came on the other side and then all around my tent and then i realized it's a pack of wolves and they came and the sound was everywhere and i had goosebumps like all over my body and it took the breath out of me completely pitch dark of course and they, and they kind of went towards the kill and uh, it's raining <laughs> uh and as uh, as the near the kill i heard the snow leopard she had come down as well but i never heard her come down and there was growls and snarling and the fight broke out to see this wolf pack and the snow leopard couldn't kill a single frame and freaking out in the tent and just like <laughs> why don't i have infrared lights or, you know something to film this uh, and i had not put camera that next to it either so it won't disturb the the clue Uh, at that point but uh, you know uh, that passed and then uh, around 3:34 this wind came blowing and when the wind blew uh, i heard this low growl that came and i was like i thought the wolves were back and they had smelled me and they were curious and wondering what this is uh, but the growl went away but i moved the bit and again the growl came and then i realized the growl was actually from my chest because i was getting a uh, fluid in my lungs that night and i had a walkie talkie which didn't work and i really thought i needed to be evacuated uh, from there and i realized that if i was if i changed my position breathing got a bit easier for whatever reason and i managed to spit out a bunch of phlegm Uh, and I felt a bit better, and then I, I passed out. I think I, I fell asleep, and then I woke up in the morning, and uh, you know, the kill was there. There was no snow leopard, but I realized that it, that was a close call for me, and that's why I think I shouldn't have been there alone in the night. I would still do it, but not alone. <laughs> and uh, so after this eventful, memorable night, these are the only shots I got. We waited, but she never returned, and that was the last we saw of her. And that was it. <laughs> so all this drama, everything happened in Rome. So that we have to put this into the film, even though there's, you know, it's just like a half year passed or something. And then we spent a year, uh, more than a year, I think, just repeating it, camera tapping, going back, uh, filming whatever we could. Uh, different aspects of the story, and then we managed to pitch it to Animal Planet. Yeah, uh, yeah. They were looking. Basically, they were looking for content, and we had been filming for almost two years. Uh, that's not a year. Uh, yeah, I mean, including research and all of that. And so we, uh, they had just enough budget for post post production. So we kind of. Uh, Put our heads together as a team and looked at what we had collected so far, and what kind of stories should be told around this footage. And that's where I think we started. And by this time, I think we had also heard uh, Stanzen and other people over there telling us how close the, we realized how close the leopard was coming to human habitation. And uh, you know, and we had spoken to you as well, and. Uh, some of your lovely shots have been used in the film. Yeah. So you had spent so much time. Uh, so everyone who had spent time there had uh, realized how close they were coming to human habitation. So that actually triggered uh, us to say that okay, so let's try and tell the story from Gamo's eyes, but of this habitat that not not much is known about yet, like the ocean. Yeah. So I think when the research began, and uh, we found some really dreadful stuff. But I don't know if you want to well, share that now. It's there. So I'll I'll just take the trailer of the film, uh, and there's a couple of shots in that as well.
We had an amazing encounter last winter in the dark. We placed camera traps around the kill and waited. As we had hoped, they captured the resident female snow leopard, Gyamo, the queen of these mountains. And that was the last we saw of her. I've been filming wildlife for the past 40 years and use films as a tool to push laws and policies in favor of some of the most endangered species of the planet. To truly understand the snow leopard and the challenges it faces today, it is imperative to understand the people who share its home. But today, we live on a broken planet. It's going to be hard. The only way we can make this work is actually follow the ibex, follow the prey and find the leopard. There, there. Can you see all those bug marks? We have four camera traps. So one over there. Yeah, him that rocket has already set up. One, two, three, four. Great. The planet is going through a troubled time. We humans are making the world suffering. There are more than 5,000 dogs in Leh alone. This is alarming. This is the bull trap I was talking to you about. Snow leopards are still being hunted across their range. Some captured alive and hundreds of others killed for their skins. You know, we still don't know how many snow leopards there are in the dark, you know, which is a shame. Uh... Finding Gyamu is the key. Even if there's a slim chance, we will have to take it. And this was, uh, you know, so the film has done pretty well. Uh, people have liked it and enjoyed it. And uh, what they remember the most is not the snow leopard, but they do remember this landfill, which I, I would assume is India's highest landfill. And uh, Stanzin took us there. Stanzin is also a filmmaker. We mentioned him so many times. And uh, it was a bit naive of us to not think that there would be a landfill in a city like Leh. It's just that it's the furthest thing from your mind, I suppose, because there's so much beauty around it. Uh, but it's very much there. It's very much still there. There, there uh, I believe there are efforts being made to uh, shift it. But I think it has to be just a change in the way we are creating that garbage. You know, like, I mean, the, the plastic, there is no where for it to go. They, they can only burn it. And I'm of the opinion, and then there was a conference that happened in Ladakh uh, with, with the ministry and the government, and we went there, we showed them the landfill footage. And they are trying to clean it up and trying to, in fact, make it into a tourist spot, they want to grow stuff there and all of that. And I hope it starts that conversation of, you know, single-use plastic should not be in places where there is no disposal, you know, policy or method or technique or whatever you want to call it. And because it's huge and, uh, you know, in the film we talk about it, how just by being in Ladakh, we have all contributed to this pile. And this is just one corner of it. Uh, and it's, it's extremely depressing. The, the air is toxic. Because uh, you know, there's, you can see a burnt patch on the left uh, there. They're constantly burning stuff, and your lungs hurt within a minute of being there. And uh, besides garbage, you see so much waste. Like there, there were like cartons and cases of uh, unopened soda bottles. You know, I don't know if they expired or whatever. Eggs, hundreds of eggs, just crates of them just over there. Chickens, like a pile of chickens and there were there were dogs there next to the chicken who weren't eating because they were so full. I mean, that's the level of wasted to get the garbage part. And it's obviously, it's all tourism industry related. And and, and the conversation did get started at this conference and everyone is concerned about it. But I hope this concern, you know, translates itself into something because it is definitely very worrying. And then even in, in Han Lake, uh, you know, there is an issue uh, around Sokar Lake when you were there. Uh, you know, and uh, I'm sure you've been to Sokar as well. It's beautiful and pristine and there is no garbage disposal method over there. There, there is a garbage truck that does rounds, 
so people dig holes and keep their garbage in it but every time and it's so windy over there every time there's a big gust and they even have those dust devils over there it just picks up the garbage and just scatters it so in the evening you can see all the shiny shiny stuff it's all plastic and even though it's so i mean it's ha- i mean not many tourists make it to sofa yeah. i think it's yeah. quite still quite remote and but you could see the beginnings of this of yeah. this kind of because now there are four or five camps there next to each other mm-hmm. or little motels or whatever and it is the beginning of this i mean we see this here in goa as well uh, so it's uh, obviously a, a national emergency with how we deal with our garbage so but especially like gautam said in ladakh it just becomes uh, multiplied because there is nothing holding it in one place it's just human habitation and the landscape is just one and it just gets flown everywhere that's the scale of it that's a truck in the middle if you can see it uh yeah and uh, i think our research found that three of these uh, during uh, high tourist season three trucks fully loaded trucks empty uh, uh, empty themselves in this landfill for that entire summer tourism uh, period Which uh, is, at least, I think it's gone up. Yeah, this is this up. is uh, obviously outdated. Should find out. So it's just tons and tons of garbage, and this is what has directly led to the feral duck uh, dogs problem in the dark as well. So, so we still want to tell these uh, stories, but we want to tell them in more engaging ways, uh, and where the impact is is deeper and longer lasting. uh you know I mean, there is a shock value which works but then you can only shock people to a certain time uh in you know, a for a certain time like we are all quite uh, immune to climate change talk for example or global warming or melting ice caps we just heard it too many times so this image is uh obviously not real <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, this is uh Our project, which we are just finishing, uh, I think next couple of days we finish it, is to tell stories from the Himalayas with virtual reality uh, to make it much more immersive and uh, uh, to transport people. And, and if it's done right, it is transportive. If it's seen right, actually, I should say, it's transportive. Where you need this headset and need headphones, and uh, it's. It's still new. We're experimenting with it, uh, but we took the film back to uh, to Ladakh, and I showed it to a few people, and uh, the reactions were amazing. I'll share that as well. Uh, there are some images with a 360 camera on a drone, and it's really fun. You can do some fun stuff with it as well. I mean, this is not how you see it in the headset. In the headset, it's more like like that. This is uh, you can get stills out of it. So this is called the the little planet. <laughs> Look, and uh, that's the 360 camera we used. Uh, and then we, our, our big mission this time was to try and, uh, you know, get wild snow leopards to come in front of this camera, in, or 360 VR camera. And it just seemed impossible. I mean, there's no way because these are not camera traps; they won't trigger by themselves. Uh, but we thought we'd figure it out as we. As and when you know we got that opportunity, and we spent about 40 days filming all over. There were no opportunities at all. There was one rescued snow leopard. We thought we could maybe even put a green screen on the cage at the back and just have it walk past. You know, we started thinking in those terms. And uh, but but we did get lucky, and I'll share that shot with you as well. So this is us climbing up to a ridge to place a regular camera trap that uh, we had built, which we were talking about. With all this drilling and all of that. <laughs> uh, so this is this shot was taken from a 360 camera, and you can see that little tiny marker up there on the mountain ridge. That's where we were climbing up. And then along the way, we saw some really amazing, uh, you know, signs of life springing out of the snow in spite of the cold. And uh, I knew Dhoir would love this shot. So I said, I said, took it for her. She has a special connection to like liking, <laughs> which takes 
<laughs> yeah, because I I just uh, I feel as filmmakers, it's it's so easy to get lost in you know trying to get this and that and you know the noise of it all, and then then it, but we are so lucky as uh, people who tell stories about the natural world is. We can. We have constant reminders of humility around us. You know, like if you just spend time looking while you're filming, or just being on location, you see these tiny little things that uh, you can observe, and they tell you just to be humble, and it's all going to be fine. Yeah. And each one of these has a name in Ladakhi, which I don't remember. Of course, I should have written it down. And, and each one of them has a use or medicinal property attached to it, and uh, you know, will this knowledge stay? And how do we preserve it? And these are, and uh, it has nothing to do with the snow leopard, except that it it builds the habitat. It wasn't part of our film, but but this is where you know you start wondering: Are you saying enough? Are you? You know, doing a disservice by not talking about these other things, but there's just so much to talk, so much to tell that we have to end up choosing sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, I think I find these fascinating. <laughs> so then we reach this mountain ridge after a couple of hours of uh, walking. It wasn't the worst climb in the world, but <laughs> it was fine because because what what really works with uh, AMS uh, to acclimatizing, I found is if you do. Really hardcore cardio for two weeks, and my acclimatization has become much, much faster. I used to get the worst headaches like each time, no matter what I did, uh, and that doesn't happen any anymore. So for two weeks, I'm like working out twice a day, 20-30 minutes each time, just getting my heart rate up. So we reached and we found this the tail is also burst. My slides. Tail is. I love how the tail just flies in the snow. In all the way, hopefully, right towards the camera traps. And then that rock over there is where we decided to put our camera trap because uh, we we smelled the rock and we found a little bit of fur also attached to it. So we figured that this is uh, a point where it probably stops smell if we're lucky. Market territory. So we started setting up uh, camera traps over there. So you see those boxes. That's what we you end up trying to just build yourself. Uh, it's just pelican cases, uh, and you just drill holes in them. Has to be the diameter of the lens. You make them nice and snug, and you need a trigger, uh, which is infrared. You just hopefully work. They fail all the time, which is the most frustrating thing to do. I'm just yeah. Uh, so we placed two camera traps over there uh, because it takes almost the same amount of effort. It just be criminal to place only one and then it, it fails. So we set up two, hoping that if not one, if not both, then at least one should uh, work. And uh, and then you know you have to secure it. So you hide the cable because you know uh, a naughty fox or a marmot might come and chew it up and do <laughs> whatever. Uh, and then you, uh, and there were cubs in that area, so cubs are always playful. So we picked up the biggest rock we could, and we placed it on top of it so that at least they don't knock it over. Uh, and that's the setup. And then we did some major jugad because after all these years of uh, trying to get snow leopards in camera trap, like you know, everyone wants that daylight shot, uh, you know, with this beautiful mountain ridge at the back, but the chances of it coming. And the camera trap working is, uh, you know, it's slim. So we only got a couple of daylight shots after all those years. So I worked with a jugad to do a motion triggered light that could come on as well, and uh, a fixed light. So it's not like a flash, but it would come in. It's an LED light, and I attached a solar charger to it as well. And uh, because out of all the camera trap footage, ninety percent was at night or in the evening. So we figured that if we're going to get the shot, we need to have light on it. So you can see the light is on over there, and and it worked. 
<laughs> and we were really happy to see that uh, he wasn't bothered by the light at all. So it was a concern. And uh, you can sort of see the mountain ridge at the back. Once we color grade it, the mountains will come out a bit more. And uh, that he came, did his thing, and had left. And this was uh, with our Sony camera, so it was 4K footage. It was exactly what we wanted. So it was like four years of, I think, trial and error to finally get this image to work. And then promptly after this, the camera trap started failing. <laughs> but we got the shot. <laughs> yeah, it's super frustrating. So here, here I, I color graded a bit more so you can see the mountain range at the back. And uh, we got lucky and uh, there's an Ibex skill that happens and we managed to place the same set up near an Ibex skill and I uh, got some screen grabs from that as well. Here it is, the female Ibex. You can see how big the Ibex are actually compared to the snow level. And here's that lovely tail, one of the best tails out there I think. So, so we went back with this, uh, with the VR film and we wanted the first people to see it were the people of Ladakh. And I wanted, because one of the films is in Ladakhi, the native in Ladakhi, and that's an all-out conservation film. Uh, and it talks about all of the issues, especially the garbage, about changing climate. And uh, I wanted to see how people respond to that in Ladakhi and if, uh, in, in Ladakh. And if there was anything which I may have misrepresented, we may have misrepresented uh, through that. And I think it was uh, supremely gratifying to see how people received it. Mm -hmm. uh, one lady started crying after she saw the landfill. She, was, she had nothing to say, actually. She just you know, stuck her camera, she's like, uh, and she's an old lady, so she like seen life. And uh, she was just uh, standing in silence. Uh, there was a guy, a Ladakhi guy from uh, Gya. He, he saw the snow leopard sequence and uh, half an hour after he saw it, he got tears in his eyes and he came back to me and he's like, I never thought I would see something like this in my life. I don't know what I'm feeling right now. And then he uh, then he came back with his kids and his uh, wife and I showed it to them as well. So, you know, it kind of helps. Uh, I mean, these things feel better than awards or, you know, recognition because you really feel that is worth something if you can touch someone uh, and create a memory for them. It's a set of three films that's on the Himalayan habitat. The Himalayas, like they've never been seen before. Come experience the habitat, the wildlife, and the lives of the people who live here. Cinematic 360 VR. to the Himalayas, coming soon in 360. I to film a, a, a village and a before and after the snow before it came in and this uh, beautiful man came, Meme Grandpa mm -hmm. and he had this amazing voice and it's that penny drop moment where he's just like, oh my god, I can suddenly see the film. <laughs> He has to narrate the film, <laughs> so uh, but which wasn't possible because the script had already been written. So he's like, okay, we have to write an entire scene. So we, we wrote a scene where uh, the gentleman you see there, the Meme, so who is telling his grandson a story of uh, water. Yeah. And he, he said, if you don't take care of water, then the stream will uh, disappear because there's a there's a fairy or there's a spirit that lives in the water and so 
the basically the grandson is uh, throwing rocks and gobar and all these things in the water and uh, the, the the spirit of the water the, the jinn gets really upset and says that you better stop doing it uh, because if you don't i'll i'll go away and the boy didn't listen and then he went to it the spirit went to it and then so did the the river and the stream with it so it's like if you take care of water the water will take care of you was the, the uh, lesson of the story so we trying to think of where we could have him sit and do this and then this other and this is so typical of that another lovely man came and said oh do you want to see my room he <laughs> said like okay and you know how all the ladakhi rooms are there and i was like oh yeah no maybe but he took us to this room which was his original kitchen it's a it's over 100 years old and it was just like <gasps> for a time machine <laughs> so this is uh, you know all these pots and pans i'll try and zoom in over here an old chula it was just incredible to see and it was freezing cold in this room and this meme was just amazing if you all these buttons so we were hiding in this corner but then we removed ourselves from that uh, shot <laughs> obviously it's quite amazing how uh, all these uh, stories that are probably i don't know hundreds or even thousand years old and there is so much connection with nature and you know through and that oral history is kind of disappearing uh, and we in we were in nagaland recently uh, telling uh, shooting filming some stories of similar environmental stories there and uh, even there there are these stories being told of how and it's woven into the silks they weave into uh, the clothes they wear you know and into agriculture and the crops they grow the songs they sing when they are sowing a particular seed there's so much knowledge in these stories and uh, i mean that's incredible and actually that is uh, quite sad it's disappearing and this is the landfill and that plastic pile and in 360 you can see that so we place the camera right in the middle of the pile this time and uh, yeah and there's a man over there who's picking bottles from there and sorting through the garbage uh, and that's the subtitles in 360 because it's it's being narrated in ladakhi it's uh, it's actually stands in norbusan who's narrating it <laughs> and uh, yeah i I gave him no choice. <laughs> you are the one. And it's it. You bang in the middle of the of the landfill here. I can almost smell it. Uh, you know that that smoke. All the smoke you see is just from the burning garbage as well. And then we got our snow leopard shot. And this was really uh, just pure pure luck. On literally the last day. of the shoot norbu who had called me that time and uh, he had asked me that time as what, what is your dream shot and i said female with cubs in the snow on an ibex hill and i had gone that time and never got the shot so he came on literally the last year of the shoot he said what is that thing you said you had wanted as i and this is 4 years later <laughs> like female with cubs in the snow on an ibex hill he said come with me and we uh, we came and there it was very very far away so i was like that is not filmable uh, no like the, the producer directed my headset and then we took a breath and said okay we can at least place camera trap and let's try placing the the 360 camera trap because it was on a pretty high up this was a tough climb and we would have to trigger the camera from as far away as the the wireless trigger would allow which is normally about 300 meters but for some reason it worked to about 800 meters over here somehow it would the signal would break come back break come back there literally and there was not no way to hide so right at the bottom of the hill and then walk further there's only one rock over there Because uh, you know from the footage we could see that snow leopards can see really well from high up there. If you're walking around, they know people are walking around down there. So we were we were happy to have this one rock which I hid behind with just one uh, hand up, almost like like one hand with a phone coming out like that, and the signal 
would come and go and then on the walkie talkie Nauru said after you know 20 minutes of waiting so again there were failing light battery going and this wifi not working and there's a like, classic just so you just given up you're at <laughs> the mercy of fate and then uh, he came and walked he said wo oh, hill rahi hai she's moving and the, the signal came on for a second i just pressed record and it started rolling and we got this shot of uh, snow leopards in uh, in 360 one of those uh, moments yeah yeah just i mean you can't plan it you can plan for it yeah but there's no way to uh, and it was a like a really pure wildlife moment it just happened we happened to be there the camera happened to work uh, you know and and we are lucky that we can share it with people in a way where it's not possible to actually experience something like that you can't be next to a wild cat when it's on a kill like you even on a hide in a hide you can't be this close to any animal and this really gives it that uh, that special feeling so yeah, so i mean uh, this was this is the the first uh, 360 footage of wild snow leopards i mean and you can do this right on 360 you can go close to it and look at what yeah. she's looking at magical <laughs> <laughs> really magical so we are all the way down there in the valley like right? somewhere the like, way invisible that's the last house in mm-hmm. the Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure. So people are there, and there's one rock which is beyond this ridge. I'm hiding somewhere there, that far away. Well, it shows a lot for uh, the camera. It's amazing that it worked. It just God yeah. wanted it to happen at that time. That's the key, isn't it? I mean, four years of filming and and learning how to change your story along the way, and learning to. to look at things from an angle that you hadn't ever thought you would be doing when you started off on the journey that's oh. the incredible thing about filmmaking um so so i just wanted to understand how do you pick a location how do you pick um what animal you're going to work on because like you said there's a thousand stories out there so how do you shortlist how do wow you- <laughs> i think it's a I think you don't shortlist. I think you are just uh, open and talking to people all the time, mm-hmm. and I think that's where it comes from. Like you hear a story and you want to tell it, and so I think you are not shortlisting. I think mm-hmm. you're just talking and meeting and keeping and being alert to what's happening in the world and uh, keeping yourself informed. And I think. I think that's where yeah. I would say that's where the stories come from. I mean, the snow leopard journey began with that us. that rainy shot when you're looking for a lynx. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think at any point there are a few ideas in our heads, like like anyone, and a lot of times there is no funding or budget for it. So when we started the first snow leopard thing, it was just all self-funded. Whenever we could pull out money from another project or time allowed, go try film, come back and keep seeing it, exploring it. Uh, there's a story. Uh, so like like we're working on uh, bears now, brown bears, and I've been a few times. That's also taken about five years to find the right location, and uh, but there's no funding for it. So we now in the pitching process and re-pitching it. And broadcasters is uh, I mean it's a business, right? So if they've already got two bear films, they're like, oh, we don't need a third bear film. Uh, or this year we want only you know cute animals, right? So no matter how important it is, uh, you actually have someone saying we only want cute animals. Well, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Because it's all entertainment by the end of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the reality of it. It has to be entertaining enough, even if it's conservation. Mm-hmm. So now we're trying to figure out uh, a way of doing comedy and conservation together, maybe. and uh, that might be a, an experiment. And this lockdown is perfect for it. <laughs> <laughs> the least done, you know. Fantastic. I think maybe also uh, urgency of something. Yeah. Actually, urgency of something that's happening. You want to tell that story, and that leads you to the next thing. 
uh, yeah, that's the, this is the big idea question, right? Which doesn't really have an answer. Yeah. Where do ideas come from? Yeah. <laughs> which comes first, funding or the idea? <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, it's also, I mean, after you've heard everything and thought about it, it's your gut that tells you, right? Which one to pick and, and which one to go after. And I think there's no uh, explanation for it or something that you can, you know, write down on a piece of paper like a formula for people to follow. Yeah, I think yeah. so. And I think it's a combination of access resources that you can spend, people you know. So I'll, I'll show this to you. Can you see it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So this is in, in Gyamo, the film, when we go up and you, it's, it's there in the trailer, that shot where I'm pointing and you place the camera trap here, 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 mm -hmm. and you climb for hours on this beautiful mountain ridge. Mm -hmm. This is what happened over there, but we didn't put it in the film. Uh, so I should explain. So we found that we found a pug mark, and it looked like it had just been there. I got like majorly excited. Like, oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! No, no, no! It has to be here. We'll quickly place the camera trap, and then I found this wet patch over there. Like it peed. It marked its territory. Or, you know, it left a wet patch, and so that's the patch I'm pointing to over there. So when the Smith it, it? So I, the audio is bad. The there was a uh, there was a ghorawala with us who was helping us carry some stuff. It was his pee. While we were excited and looking at the bug mark, he had gone and taken a little pee over there and he wasn't even telling me for the longest time I mean I was sniffing it, he was standing and watching me wondering why I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. there he is I can't, I can't believe me oh my god <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's like the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the bottom I mean, uh, the, uh, talking about ideas and putting them together, I mean, we had this bank of footage and then uh, all the footage of Mike and Gotham you see in Yamo is actually uh, was filmed in like so we built the story wrote the script built a structure and we went back for 10 days and did all of that filming in one go and then plugged it in together into making yeah. the structure so that was actually really fun that was uh, and that's something i think filmmakers i mean as filmmakers i really enjoy is once yeah. the shooting is done is just looking at it and stitching it together but there's satisfaction huh i mean at the end of it when you actually manage to Finish the film. What a what a feeling that. Yeah. Yeah. And then it goes on air, and then it's over. <laughs> and over, so then you put it away, and you get on with your next amazing option. Build up, and it's over. So what are you working on now? Is it which species are you working on? Which part of the world? So uh, right now, Doyle is uh, busier than I am. Uh huh. I've got a new lens, a uh, probe lens, so I'm busy looking for dead bugs and insects and uh, I've got caterpillars in the Kadi Patta. <laughs> I'm busy working on a, a, a environmental, leaning more onto the environmental side travel show. So you can do a travel show differently. Yeah, no, that that is, a, yeah, it's a 13 part series for, uh, on, on Northeast uh, and uh, Mike is hosting it. So we were filming uh, last year unbelievable now but we were filming in november and december in the northeast so doing the post for that now it's a 13 episode all the states of the northeast and we're trying to tell stories of uh, conservation in it but from a travel angle so why where why people go to these beautiful amazing places and they're still quite uh you know intact some of them so how can they go informed and travel responsibly? So interesting and, and trying to break some stereotypes of how we perceive uh, people who live in the Northeast and what their aspirations are and 
what their lives are so a lot of the stories are from their perspectives so some stories are told by mike and some stories are being told by people from their themselves not to uh, not to exoticize uh, the, the the culture the, the you know uh, food things like that so quite fun yeah so we are we should be done we are doing it all remote now which is quite exciting <laughs> editing remotely with the editors in delhi and i'm here and that it's fun it's it's it, it's it's going to be exciting the stories are incredible it sounds it i love the northeast in any case so i think it's yeah. um, it's just, magical to just get anything out of that part of the world because it's a wonderland yeah it uh, is yeah yeah, yeah. So, it's a good title for the series, Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> What yeah. are? Yeah, the incredible stories of uh, Lokta, which I first came to mind because just edited that mm-hmm. and the habitat there, and just ties it in with this whole what we did with the snow leopards as well. I mean, so Lokta is uh, the lake, and right next to it is Kebul Amjau. Yeah. yeah, one of the most incredible places I think It's that. It's on my bucket list. I keep saying I need to go there, and I never make it. But I'm going to go there one of these days. I have friends who are doing research there, so um, I really do want to go back there. Beautiful. Go with enough time because it's really vast and very difficult to spot for Sangar. But uh, it's it's stunning. It's beautiful, and how uh, the, it's linked the forest. and the people who living on the lake mm-hmm. so that that came that came out filtered out in every where we went is that all the forests and people it's just also interconnected and there is no way of telling these stories without that connection now lots of ideas and we can talk about this forever but um tell me something i mean do, when you go out filming how big a crew do you normally go with are you filming normally alone how does it work Uh, depends. depends yeah. So the the time when I went in that hide, I was alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Gyamo, we were ten people. Mm-hmm. So we had two uh, camera teams, and then uh, for that time, for, for all the wildlife stuff, it was only me and an, uh, uh, an assistant to help me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and possibly uh, a third person, usually local, mm-hmm. to help with. Sharing the driving, or uh, you know, just kind of translating stuff, or whatever it might be. Uh, the larger group came in, and we were doing all the bits with uh, Dad and me. Uh, and since we had only ten days, since the budget would allow only that, we knew we had to shoot as much as we could. So optimize that time. So if we had one camera shooting us, we sent the second one to go film, film the village, finish that, come back, take some more shots with us. And, And for the northeast travel, northeast was a bigger crew because it was just. But I think an ideal crew is about uh, for these kind of documentaries is about four people: uh, a director, uh, a DOP who's filming, and in, in in our case, usually director is also filming. So two cameras end up uh, filming. A sound recordist, I think, uh, is really key and. Uh, And an assistant to help, you know, do extra shots. Or I mean, these are tough locations, so you really need to spend a lot of time at the end of the day maintaining your equipment and uh, keeping it in shape for the next day. So, an assistant, uh, a camera person, a director, and a sound recordist, I think, makes for a good, good yeah. team. But why not the the leaner the better? And are you going back to do the links still? Yes, it's back. It's back. Friend of mine um, and I are planning to go on a link trip as well. Oh. We're going on this, and I'll connect you. Um, he's also doing one of these series. Stuart oh. Chapman. He's actually got this goal to see all of the cats in the world, um, and I think he's on species twenty-five at the moment. Wow! Wow! So, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, with you, with your luck, he'll probably yeah. see all of them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, but the other thing, that's the other thing. I think I realize now. It feels like some people are just lucky. lucky. Yeah. Maybe their energy or something, but they are just luckier than others. 
It's good, good, good to tag with them. <laughs> So we have to tag along together. Hopefully, the lockdown will lift and we can um, actually get back into the jungles and um, make some more films. <laughs> See you soon, and thank you for doing this. It's just been fantastic. Thank you both. It's it was just marvelous. Thank you. Thank right. you, Latika. Thank Bye. You. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. inculcate these values in children at the right age it'll hold them to life you and i will always remember the visits we went on with our dads right <laughs>